You're one of the survivors from the rescue team, right? I just ran into your teammate, Carlos. How did a girl like you manage to survive? Hey, I'm no ordinary civvy. I'm a member of STARS. You mean the RPD Special Force Team? Jill! That's great advice from a not-so-special Special Forces Brad. Now, Resident Evil is the most iconic of horror franchises. Not the father of survival horror, but certainly the one that popularised it as I covered in detail in my previous Resident Evil 4 retrospective. Check it out if you're still interested in some more Resi action. It returns here with a remake of the third game for the second time in as many years. How many more can come? Well, Resident Evil 4 is probably on the cards as we speak. But until we see the return of the Los Illuminados, instead we are poised with Jill's battle with the Nemesis in Raccoon City before the events of Resident Evil 2. Let's dive into a full analysis in my Attention to Detail series. It's gonna get messy. Resident Evil. With our return to the Resident Evil saga, we now see Jill Valentine up against more than just zombies. Nope, indeed, they are now the least of your worries, with a 10-foot nemesis your single biggest threat. It's far more focused and very different to the original PS1 back in 1999, which also came a year after the Resident Evil 2 release as well. And therefore, it's far more symbiotic than you probably would have thought from first glance. In fact, it's a couple of months closer than the original release, and like that original game, it crisscrosses the original Resident Evil 2 titles and therefore lots of areas, lots of scenery. And thus, in modern times, that means asset reuse, material reuse, and character reuse. Now, that's not a bad thing. This is the same type of game, and it is designed to crisscross between Resident Evil 2 and 3, just like the original release in 99. So that's not a bad thing overall. And there are some good points in the title where it does lead you into the elements that happened in Resident Evil 2, and you get to see some of the backstory and how certain things happened. And I think they do a good job of that overall, and significantly changing your expectations from the original Resident Evil 3, but not all of that is as positive as 2 was. It is a shorter game, it's a more focused game, but one of the biggest letdowns I think overall, and I think generally this will be across the board, is the Nemesis encounters have now been significantly altered to be far more scripted, and therefore less surprising and in enjoyable than I think the Mr. X elements were from Resident Evil 2, but again there are some good boss battles in here if they are very much in the same mould of Resident Evil 2 and previous Resident Evil games where it's a case of dodge, grab ammo, shoot and kill with enough twists, turns, puzzles and action to satisfy your every need and more than enough zombies with a hunger to chew on your arse. <laughs> As we saw in the prior release of Resident Evil 2, significant changes have been made to the overall gameplay design and style. But by far the biggest is the visual and audio upgrades. No longer limited by pre-rendered backdrops and polygonal characters, now everything is fully 3D and well realised and destructible thanks to the RE engine. But there have been some changes and updates in terms of the original RE engine that we saw in Resident Evil 2. And not all of those are for the better. The destructible element of the title is still present. You can still blow zombies' arms, legs off as they crawl towards you and destruct them, but it's no longer as ever present in the title. Certainly in certain sections, you can't do it at all. Hitting zombies with grenade launchers does nothing more than just add a decal on there for the colour and skin with nothing coming off at all. I wouldn't say this is a cutback performance. I'm pretty sure it's not. It might be the fact that it was made in parallel and they hadn't fully embedded it when this title went into the final final throws of their development, but that seems unlikely considering it was a year ago that Resident Evil 2 came out, or it's the fact that they've just taken it out for other reasons, but the procedural impact of the animation and the vertex points of bullets hitting zombies is still as satisfying and gratifying as ever when you're mowing down those undead hordes.
So before we get into the meat of the engine, let's look at the console and PC comparisons and certainly that all important performance metric. Now the Xbox One X deserves a special mention here because when it was released, it originally targeted a fully native 4K. Well, I say native, but it uses the interlace mode or at least the console equivalent of the interlace mode, which is different on the PS4 Pro than it is on the Xbox One, the Xbox One S and the PC. Now the console versions do exist it a almost checkerboard like dithering pattern which is evident on the PC version as well. Now this interlace mode that I covered way back Resident Evil 7 has been improved throughout the games that have released from RE Engine in this generation and at this point it's the best I've seen so far. But as I zoom in and slow it down you can see the half width on geometry and then the standard stochastic dithering used on all the shading elements including alpha. So on the original 4k version of the Xbox One X it was actually rendering at 1920 by 2160 and now it's rendering it at 1440 by 1620 which then brings it back to 2880 by 1620. Now again the PC and the consoles are very similar but there is a subtle difference. One of those biggest differences is between the PS4 Pro and every other version. Now the PS4 Pro doesn't run the interlace mode. What it does run I believe is a checkerboard. It uses the hardware based ID buffer in the PS4 Pro to use the checkerboard solution and that's why it at the same resolution at 1620 looks ever so slightly softer in terms of detail and fine detail in certain elements but overall the image quality is sharper than it is on the Xbox One X on the same resolution because it uses that checkerboard solution therefore it can get away with running FXAA it's the only version on console that uses FXAA as its anti-aliasing solution the rest all use TAA aside the Xbox One X which appears to use FXAA and TAA like Resident Evil 2 but that means that you get much softer elements and much less specular highlights you can see this on the lips and the cutscenes and obviously on the jacket here of Mikhail as he's sitting on the train talking to Jill you can see the specular highlights in his jacket fluttering and shimmering on the PS4 Pro and again here at 1620p with FXAA on. Turn it off and it looks like every other console version and the PC with TAA turned on and that is a much softer title but less shimmer less movement and the pro suffers from that lots of specular highlights lots of breakup lots of shimmering across the board because it's using that hardware based checkerboard solution it doesn't need to incorporate the TAA into it and that's what we're seeing now the engine itself doesn't require TAA to reconstruct the image as well the interlace solution here is very impressive and overall the difference between going from interlace to standard once two frames are in is almost the same and you certainly can only really notice it if you dig into side-by-side -side comparisons like this. Now, the difference going from the 4K mode to the 1620p mode on the Xbox One X, that's again very, very subtle. But it is a reduction in image quality. You can see a difference in the hair, certainly. The alpha effects, the fins on the hair, the dithering is, is more pronounced and it's, it's less stable on the 1620p mode. And obviously those high frequency fine details, again, like the sweat and the pores of skin on uh, Mikhail's face or uh, Jill's face, just get reduced subtly between the two versions you can definitely see that reduction in sharpness and clarity and again this highlights a little bit in the background the objects even though they're they're covered in doff and obviously doffed out to hell you can still see a reduction in the pixel count on some of those horizontal and vertical lines but it's very very minor and then again between the 1620p mode on both the Pro and the X it's very close indeed the only real difference is you do get certain highlights of shimmer and sh specular which show up more easily on the Pro as I've already covered due to the FXA solution which the Series X doesn't have ah oh, sorry getting ahead of myself there I mean Xbox One X Carlos, I've reached the main avenue. Which way do I go? See a big transmission tower? That's the substation. You'll have to circle around through an alley to your right to get there. You mean the alley that's on fire? Maybe. Surely a tall drink of water like yourself can put out a few flames. <sighs> Fuck you. So the base console models have a slightly different story to tell and that is that the PS4 is a native 1920 by 1080 it does not use the interlace mode everything is rendered with a fully native resolution and then the Xbox One uses both the interlace mode and then it also uses the dynamic percentile scale which it can drop down to basically 1600 by 900 which means that the Xbox One X has a scaling of 30% give or take from its highest to lowest point and it's around 50% at its best point 
point lower than the PS4. That means we're getting resolutions from 800 by 900 or 960 by 1080, which is then reconstructed back to 1920 by 1080. Unsurprisingly, in terms of order of image quality, the Xbox One is the worst, and for the PS4 Pro is probably tying up with the Xbox One X, simply because those specular aliasing highlights are a bit of an eyesore occasionally, which you don't get on the Xbox One X, but you get slightly sharper image quality on some of the finer details and high frequency details. The other kept put cutbacks really are to do with resolution. So shadow quality is certainly paired back on all versions with the lowest resolution, with the Xbox One being the worst. And then the Xbox One really loses out on one of the effects, and that's screen space reflections. They're largely turned off in most of the cutscenes in many parts of the gameplay. They're not always off. There are points where they appear to be on, but majority of the time I've seen, they're, they are turned off. And again, this is just another benefit to help the um, performance on the base consoles. But overall, image quality is very close across all consoles. And if it's resolution you're after, then now there isn't really a lot between the Pro and the Xbox One X. But before, if you were interested in resolution, then pre-patch the Xbox One X if 4K, but that does come at the cost of performance, which I'll touch on next. And that means that dropping down a whopping 46% in resolution brings back nearly all of that performance deficit that the original release had at 4K interlaced mode. Nothing else seems to have changed other than the resolution drop. Everything else seems to be the same settings as compared to the PC and all of the versions minus what I've just talked about with the Xbox One, which I'll cover in a moment. So that means that you're getting performance that went from never hitting 60 FPS. It just did not hit 60 FPS at any point, but now it hits 60 FPS more often than not. It's not a locked 60 and it's not a locked 60 on any format whatsoever, well PC obviously, but that all depends on your hardware. But that reduction in resolution of 44% going down from a fully 8.2 million pixels to 4.6 million pixels, that's what you're getting from 2880 by 1620, means that we see all of that return to the performance metric. And that means almost 100% nearly at times between the lowest point pre-patch and the lowest point post-patch. The old low point of 26 FPS is now replaced by a low of 48 in the new patch, 84% improvement. And this just continues with the average, going from 42.1 to 58.7. That's a huge, sorry, 58.4. That's a huge improvement and shows that the reduction in resolution is the best choice and the most obvious one to make that performance all the way back. And it just looks and plays much better now because it doesn't have those consistent dips in fact, it never hit 60 FPS. And just to touch on it, just going back to the FXAA TAA solutions, people might not think it's not using the hardware well, but it actually is. From bearing in mind it's using the interlace mode, which is most likely not as performant as the hardware-based PS4 Pro checkerboard mode solution there with the ID buffer. So that's probably offering around 50% improvement, maybe slightly more, whereas this is only 40% based on PC tests. But then in addition, it's using that to deliver the frame time, not the frame rate, that's not the important thing, it's frame time. So going from FXAA to FXAA and TAA on PC, that gives you around 3 to 5% impact on your performance level. And that could be the difference between the teams hitting 16 0.67 milliseconds more often than not and going over by 0.8 or to 1 millisecond that's likely where that level is in terms of that gap between the two smaa is obviously even more impactful if you turn that on which is an option in pc that means they're using the hardware to not only deliver better image quality by using two highly expensive post-processing AA solutions on top of each other, not the most efficient use of hardware, but it is there. But in addition, they're also improving the performance metric over the base PS4 Pro now, which means that the target is 58 average and 57 average between the two. It's close, but it is subtly better on the X than it is on the Pro. But again, at these levels, would you, would you notice it? Probably not. That's a similar story when we move into the base console. Both versions here do target the same 60 FPS rate, but it really is a target here, and it's missed more often than not on both. Now, without a shadow of a doubt, the Xbox One S is the worst performing of the lot. It's slightly better or slightly worse than the original Xbox One X at 4K mode, but now they've patched it, it is uh, certainly much better now. The X is the best performing version overall, but the PS4 and the X 
really struggled to hit 60 FPS. Very much like Resident Evil 2, arguably slightly worse. So we're seeing averages of 38.8 on the Xbox One S and 45.8 on the PS4. That's 76% delivered or 64% delivered, 10% worse on the S. So that neither of them are great, neither of them hit 60 very often. The PS4 does, the Xbox One S never hits 60. 56 is its highest, 27 is its lowest with 35 and 60 for the PS4. It sounds better on the PS4, but arguably they're both not great and they're both not the way you'd want to play this game at 60 fps i said it on resident evil 2 i'll say it again here they should just offer a 30 fps cap and play it. it both versions would feel much better much smoother more consistent because they don't hit 60 often enough they don't hit 60 milliseconds often enough um they never really feel smooth and consistent you get used to it it does improve input latency times but it's not a huge improvement overall so i would have preferred them to cap this at 30 fps but if you don't mind these kind of fluctuating frame rates which are at this level then at least the option is there i do applaud the fact that re engine do push 60 fps on every platform it's commendable it's the best way to play a game by far but the base versions don't really deliver that level and that really carries over to comparing the pro to the ps4 you can see examples on here a little bit later in the title where things get a little bit more hectic more chaotic then down in the sewers you do get constant dips where again it never hits 60 where it will hit 60 on the pro quite often but in heavier firefights lots of alpha effects lots of explosions water specular um tessellation on the water as well lots of effects going on in one place then can drop the frame rate quite dramatically and that obviously impacts performance and enjoyment overall so the argument here is if you have the base console or premium console then definitely play it on the premium console it's the better looking the better performing and the better overall title if you don't have a higher end pc to play it on that is not to be ignored and it's a great use of the hardware that which will only benefit more when these versions end up running natively on the next generation of hardware because those little dips that we're seeing on the pro and the x will just be completely eradicated on the series x and the ps5 So the PC version is now running DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 as last time, but this time DirectX 12 is the preferred API. Across both machines and cards that I tested, it's the one to choose. They've certainly improved the performance there. And here running on the PS4 settings on a 5500 XT at 1080p mode means you get a game that can target 120 FPS. And at points, that's what you see. It can go actually slightly higher than that, but it generally hovers around the 70s to 90s. So if you've got VR are displays another benefit of the incoming series x and most likely the ps4 pro 5 although don't say it's definitely nothing's definite at this point until somebody announces it but if it does support it that means that variable refresh rates like this will actually be slightly better because you can play these options on the newer consoles and again here on this 5500 xt card which is an excellent card it actually can run 120 fps in quite demanding titles such as resident evil obviously my rtx 2070 can go much higher higher pushing you know almost fully maxed out 4k but not quite in terms of the pc settings to match console what you can see on screen is as close as i can get to identical settings these are basically the ps4 settings based on the resolution you set it at but obviously if you run on any other version then you have to turn interlace mode on now it isn't quite as good as what it is on the consoles but it's very very minor you'd have to be really looking into it like my level to really to notice a lot of the effects and issues that crop up occasionally the uh, the interlacing can break down on some of the outlines and some of the AA and post effects but it's very very rare but it does happen but the settings are on screen you can use those to max out the options on PC if you do max it out generally 
what you tend to push more on PC is volumetric lighting is higher you get a much better texture quality overall because they can push it much further out in the frustrum and obviously the uh, texture filtering is better you can turn bloom on you can turn off some of the other options like chromatic aberration and distortion which many people don't like and obviously you can turn on the CA upscale which is an option in the menu to try and improve that fidelity FX options for AMD cards to sharpen the image by lowering the resolution and increasing the sharpness which is an age-old and very solid solution to improving the image quality on a lower resolution 10 20 percent reduction on a 4k screen still looks excellent here on the 5500 xt you can still run this game at 4k on a 5500x key fully native it is obviously as you can see sub 30 fps but if you turn on the interlace mode then it's way above 30 and if you drop down some of the settings or go to 3200 by 1800 then you can still get that within today's mode on at locked 60. it's a very high performing engine on pc and console alike and it also scales exceptionally well my rtx 2070 will push this up to 4k at almost 60 fps but stick on the interlace mode and you're pretty much there at 4k max settings which is a nice treat over and above what the consoles can offer at the moment oh, not again Means after. Hey. I'll buy you some time. Hey, wait. Wait, Joe. So wrapping up the look at the RE and Resident Evil 3 title, let's take it the all-important comparison of just how good the modern title is over the PS1 original. As you can see, there's quite a few more verts. A little bit more texture detail and obviously animation and bone rigging has been improved over the original PS1. Obviously that's pointless, but I'm sure people will be doing that anyway. Now, the, the game itself is another leap forward from the RE engine. Not really because it's adding anything more that hasn't been seen in other titles, but it really highlights just how good the RE engine is and how much Capcom have spent in manufacturing an engine that allows them to have a pipeline that's so efficient. They use photogrammetry across the board, and this means that all characters, materials, and objects are scanned into the engine. They're then uh, emulated as materials, built as, as objects, built as character models and 3D models, bone rigged up, animated, and that means they can scan characters, then use them virtually in the game as they want to. And this is obviously evident with a lot of the characters in the game that have been scanned in on this and the previous title, not really known anything about the game at all. They're just using their likeness to create the character models in the game. And this tight and efficient pipeline system means that they can create more materials, more objects, and very quickly and efficiently build a world of characters, models, and materials, and then just build assets around them and build an entire world that they can stream into the hard drive, stream into RAM, and use as they need to. The visual quality of the cutscenes and the cinematics are the high point of the RE engine. And it really proves how important it is on great cinematography, along with those physically based materials. Light consumption, energy consumption, light bounce, specular, irradiance, all those elements are taken care of by the fact they scan physical materials into the game and therefore use them within the game itself, both in gameplay and cinematics. The sheer detail and characters and geometry that they use on character models, faces and hair, that's another area that Japan seemed to really be pushing forward, better than anybody else I think. They really work hard to capture the essence of real actors, real character models, and they use that by using fins, alpha transparency, alpha to coverage hair on beards, stubble, long hair, short hair, and then the, the specular parallax on eyes, the detail in their face, the subtle facial expressions, and all of that character nuance that they bring in their capture system and then their animation bone rigging system. Come on, don't look at me like that, all right? I'm not an okay, No, 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 wait, please! <laughs> What the fuck? He was infected. He might have been infected. <laughs> oh, stars this soft. No wonder so many of you dead. And what are you, UBCS, killing your own people? <laughs> he would have turned. There's your sense of self-preservation. Be under no illusion, Capcom's animation team is up there with Naughty Dog in my opinion. I've said this before and people will argue with me. They really are because not only do they use superb cinematics but they also have some of the best procedural animation system, physics based, weighted, pivoted and they combine all these with a beautiful blends excellent scripting system, procedurally generated animation, impact, physics, everything together combined into gameplay and the smooth transition between real-time cinematics and gameplay as you can see here in some of the segments really offers them a great scale of choice in both game design, cinematic appeal and overall just the quality of the RE engine always always impresses me and Resident Evil 3 is absolutely no exception. 
there obviously are some weaker points. There's some Peter Panning on some of the shadows, some of the speculant and lighting. You get some um, powdered donut moments in terms of the, the light itself casting into inwards and breaking through vertices. And you get some of the weaker alpha effects and certainly some elements that, that stand out a little where there's not much um, SSAO or there's not much occlusion on objects or contact shadows. And then the materials itself, sometimes the textures and the material layers can break down or just be very slow in the mipmap level, which again can cause some blurry, smeary textures at times. But you have to take all these into account considering what it's running at, what performance level and on what hardware. And on PC you can push past this, you can obviously improve some of those options including SSAO, HDAO and obviously adding a little bit more in terms of the mesh quality, the bloom and turning off some of that chromatic aberration which I still think is uh, too strong. And again, the motion blur in there, the perm object motion blur is very very welcome, it works very well and it obviously is a keen part of the engine but some of the sample rates and the quality of it is a little low and that really can't be improved no matter what PC you push at it. So these are certainly areas they can improve in the next generation of consoles and PC to try and improve that quality a little more and I'm sure they've got that and much much more on the cards but the RE engine is nothing short of spectacular and breathtaking over and over again and the, the quality and the seamless integration of all those elements that they've got in it really push forward here. But it's not only what they've delivered here, it's not only what they've delivered in other titles, it's what they can deliver. The fact that it already supports VR, the fact that it supports first and third person, the fact that it supports huge streamed worlds, seamless interaction from cutscene to cinematics, PBR based materials up there with the best, high frame rates, over 60 FPS, and just some of the best gameplay and cinematic direction. And the detail they put into it, Devil May Cry 5 was a good example where they used, filmed all their stuff up front, acted it all out with character models and everything else and then turn that into the games that sense of dedication to their cinematography always pushes through in all of their titles and it's no different here in resident evil 3 i'm a big fan i'm a big fan of resident evil i'm a big fan of resident evil uh, 3 i don't think it's as good as resident evil 2 that's absolutely across the board but i do think it's still a great resi game and it really is a fun blast through and for me it fits perfectly because i don't have hours and hours to spend to play through games so this was a treat for me to play through and enjoy Resident Evil and it was sufficiently different from Nemesis which I've only recently played again on the PS1 to still be a quite a fresh title overall even if I knew how it all was going to end. Anyway that's the end of this and I hope you enjoyed it and everything else that I've put together. I'll catch you very soon on the next one but if you liked it give it a thumbs up it helps comment below chat with me on Twitter and do all that good stuff if you can and if you are subscribed then please ring the bell if you're not subscribed then please subscribe and ring the bell they always help I'll catch you on the next one Carlos respond yeah what's up we didn't make it the train derailed Derailed? 